very pleased to introduce Kurt Arts, who's going to start this afternoon session talking about quarks and gluons under extreme conditions and what the computer tells us. Yeah, so thanks a lot. Also, thank you to the SA2C to give me the opportunity to talk here for mostly Swansea people and mostly not physicists, so that's, uh, that's good. So, um, I mean, immediately going to give you the outline. So the talk will not be too much about details of computations and algorithms and uh, hardware, but um, it will be about the physics, uh, but hopefully give you an idea why the physics is interesting, why it's exciting, and how our work fits into, uh, into what we do and what is happening uh, globally in this field. Um, but also then link it with Supercomputing Wheels and the uh, Academy for Computing, uh, because they're really important for us to keep the research going. So we wouldn't be able to do what we do without, without you guys. Um, so I'm going to start by just saying a few words about fundamental physics, so you know where we are in the, in the landscape of, uh, of, of nature. Um, and then talk about, so I, I decided to start with things that you know, and then slowly move into things that you don't know. That's my expectation. Um, and actually, so I call this section splitting the proton. Um, because maybe you know, so what you may have heard of us is splitting the atom. Um, so do you know when the atom was split for the first time? How long ago? 100 years, close. Actually, it was 1917, so almost 100, a little bit more than 100 years ago by Rutherford. Um, and so now um, we are essentially, what I describe here could be called splitting the proton. So we are 100 years further. And the energies you know, have gone up by many, many orders of magnitude to do this. Um, so that's what I want to describe. And then uh, show some results from our collaboration, which uh, have been done using uh, HPC uh, resources. So very basic, there are four forces in, uh, in nature. Uh, at the most fundamental level, there's electromagnetism, which we all know, it's electrons and photons. Gravity, uh, Earth, Sun, et cetera, et cetera. And then there are the two nuclear forces. Uh, the weak force is responsible for so radioactive decay and neutrinos, and also the Higgs boson falls under the cover of the weak force. And then uh, there is the strong force, and the strong force is the one that rules protons, or more general nuclei, and, and quarks and gluons. Um, so if you ask a fundamental physicist what, are the, you know, what describes nature, we would say these four forces describe everything, basically. Um, so in, in our research area, we focus on the strong force. Uh, and the reason is that it's actually the, the most difficult one uh, of all these that are listed here. And the reason is that it's, it's what is called non-perturbative, which means that you cannot solve it one process at a time. So electromagnetism um, is, of course, extremely well known. But there you can study one electron. The electron scatters with a photon or radiates a photon. This photon is absorbed by another electron. And you can really study this process in all details. Uh, and in, in the quantum theory, that's actually what uh, Feynman uh, wrote down. This quantum electrodynamics is this description of photons and uh, electrons and positrons that are constantly scattering with each other. Uh, and for the strong force, this is not possible. And maybe the, the clearest way why this is the case is that at the fundamental level, it's described in terms of quarks and gluons. So quarks are the equivalents of electrons and, and positrons, so to speak, and gluons are the equivalent of photons. Um, but in nature, we don't see quarks and gluons. We see hadrons. And, and these are protons, neutrons, pions, and kaons, et cetera, et cetera. And so you will never be able to describe this physical realization in terms of hadrons if you take one, one quark, two quark, one gluon, two gluon, et cetera. You have to take the whole picture together and solve that in order to, to see uh, the physical spectrum. Um, and that is, that's why it's called non-perturbative. And here's actually a plot from a lattice QCD uh, calculation from a French, German, Hungarian uh, collaboration, Budapest, Wuppertal, Marseille. Um, they've ordered their names in this order for, they want to get sponsorship, I guess. Ah, I wrote it wrong. It's BMW collaboration, so I should order, reorder that. Um, on the top, it's correct. Um, so he, this is a, a first principles calculation in, in QCD, where they compute the spectrum of the theory. And the spectrum does not contain quarks. It contains these hadrons. So a pion, a kaon, rho particle, the nucleon, et cetera, et cetera. And so this was a, 
a, a, a, an important calculation in a way, although nobody doubted the outcome, uh, but they've shown really from first principles uh, that if you take your quarks and gluons at a fundamental level and you compute the spectrum of the theory, you reproduce the, the spectrum that is known from, from, uh, from nature, from observations. But it's a non-trivial non calculation which involves a lot of uh, computation. Um, so a little bit more about the, the theoretical framework. It's called quantum chromodynamics. Um, so it's a modification of quantum electrodynamics that describes electrons and photons. And at, at the fundamental level, it's very easy. It's a theory that describes quarks and gluons. So here says a quark is going, it scatters with a gluon, and, uh, it, and it scatters, with, scatters with another quark and exchanges a gluon. So it's a very simple process. It's extremely well defined, so it's based on symmetries. Um, it's, it can be written down very rigorously. Um, so theoretically, there's no doubt that all of this is, is, is well defined. Um, but the issue is, of course, that these quarks, although we can write down this so-called Feynman diagram, these quarks have never been observed in nature. And that's what's called confinement. Um, and in fact, Gelman, who wrote down, who proposed this theory of quarks for, uh, for the strong interaction, said the quarks are mathematical entities. So he didn't even believe in them as being real, real particles. They were just mathematical tricks to describe the strong interaction. Um, so they are confined, quarks and gluons are confined inside hadrons. And that means that the strong interaction is really strong. You can't pull out a quark easily. And also makes it very hard to solve. And so yet another indication to see, to see that it's really hard to solve is that an analytic understanding of the emergence of, say, hadrons out of uh, quarks and gluons, um, almost, I'm saying it almost correct. I'm not saying it correct on purpose. Um, but an analytic understanding of this confinement is actually one of these Clay Institute mathematical millennium problems. So an analytic solution is worth one million, uh, one million dollars. Um, so we could all try to solve it analytically, but obviously that's not what we're doing. We just go to the computer and we get answers, but we don't get a million dollars. So it's a uh, it's payoff. Um, so as I said, quarks are always confined. However, and this is a, the other feature of QCD, when quarks are very, very close together, and I mean really, really very close together, then actually they become weaker and weaker interacting. And this is a very non-trivial result because usually uh, this is not the case. Usually the opposite happens. Say, if you take electrons and photons, uh, they become weaker in direction when you go to larger distances because they get screened by medium effect, say. Here is exactly the opposite. And this is, has been given a name, asymptotic freedom. So when they're asymptotically close together, they are free. And this is indeed a unique feature. So it was discovered theoretically by, in 1973 by these people, and it gave them the Nobel Prize in 2004. So it was a, a fundamental mathematical physics understanding of the strong interaction, which was worth the, uh, the, the Nobel Prize. But the upshot is that when quarks are brought close together, maybe you can see them. Maybe you can study them you know, almost individually. And so the question is, how can we do this? How can we bring quarks so close together that we did, don't see just protons and neutrons and pions, but we actually see quarks, uh, we actually can observe quarks. And the answer to this is to not consider elementary processes. This kind of process will, will not allow you to see a quark because it immediately uh, will appear as a hadron combined with other quarks. But instead, we can look at collective behavior, so large systems, essentially taking a lot of quarks and putting them together. And when they're so close together, this principle of asymptotic freedom applies, and they behave more like free quarks rather than confined quarks. And this business of putting quarks and gluons uh, very closely together in a kind of microscopic system is called QCD under extreme conditions, um, because it doesn't happen here or in the sun or anywhere else currently. Um, you really have to go to very extreme temperatures or very extreme densities. And so if you think about the temperature, for instance, it's expected that quarks become uh, quasi-free at temperatures of, well, in Kelvin, about two, to the two, two times 10 to the 12 Kelvin, so very, very high, high temperatures. Um, so it's much more than the temperature of the sun, for instance. Um, of course, when you pack a lot of these quarks and gluons together at this given temperature, 
you no longer talk about individual scattering processes, but it makes much more sense to talk about something else, namely to think about it in terms of uh, uh, collective behavior in order to think about the phase structure or the phase diagram. So rather than thinking about scattering processes, we think of the phase diagram. Now, you all know phase diagrams. So this is the phase diagram of water. Uh, water exists in three phases, solid, liquid, gas. Um, suppose you're at atmospheric pressure. At low temperature, you have ice. Then you go to liquid, and then you go to a gas. So this is something you're very, fam very, very familiar with. Now, the point is the same phase diagram or similar phase diagram can be drawn for the strong interaction. So if we take quarks and gluons and put them together, we have a similar phase diagram as, as with similar features as for water. In this case, the vertical axis is temperature, and the horizontal axis is the net baryon density, so the difference between the number of baryons and the number of antibaryons, or the number of quarks minus the number of antiquarks. And it has similar features. It has different phases, not fluid, liquid, or liquid, gas, and solid, but there's a low temperature phase where the quarks are confined inside hadrons. So this is actually the phase that we are in. But there is also a high temperature phase where the quarks are no longer confined. And so this is called the quark gluon plasma. And then there are very dense phases where there are many, many more quarks than antiquarks. Uh, and that's, for instance, the case in neutron stars or even in, in superconducting phases. So you know superconductivity from ordinary electron uh, a photon system, so from solid state physics, you have get superconductors, or, or, or like liquid helium. Um, so you also have superconductors when you have a lot of quarks together. They're called color superconductors. And so this is a very rich phase diagram, um, which, which, which you can explore to see where can you find quarks, how can you liberate quarks, etc. Now, you can actually uh, already see where you can liberate them if you go to very high temperature. You go into this high temperature phase, and actually this bit here says early universe. And so we know that the universe started, the whole universe started with a, a big bang. Um, it was very hot initially, and then cooled down. And initially it was so hot that the, the, there were no, no hadrons then. Everything was in, forms of, in form of quarks and gluons. So there are quarks and gluons up here. As the universe cooled down, it changed, there was a crossover here, like a phase transition, and hadrons came out of it. And currently we are, we are down here. And so this phase diagram has been you know, a source of inspiration now for many years, essentially since the discovery of QCD as the fundamental theory of the strong interactions, to try to understand the high temperature phase, the very dense phase, neutron stars. Uh, there are experiments that probe this region here. And so this is what motivates our, our, uh, our research. Um, so how can we access this, this QC, QCD phase diagram? Uh, the scales are obviously enormous. Um, the temperature scale, what I said, was 200 MeV, but that corresponds to about 10 to the 12 Kelvin, so it's enormously high temperatures. Uh, the density is very large, so here the density is accessible, but this is inside neutron stars, uh, which are observable, but not easily produced in the lab, obviously. Um, so we have access to this phase diagram, but in, in very non-trivial ways. So the first one, as I said, is high temperature. So shortly after the Big Bang, up to 10 to the minus 5 seconds after the Big Bang, the universe was in this uh, high temperature phase. Um, high density, you need s several times the density of nuclear matter, so very high density. And this appears in neutron stars, for instance. So that's, that's another access, way to have access. But these first two don't appear in the lab. You can't, you know, you do make observations. And early universe was only, well, has already happened. Um, but in the lab, you can do something else. So if you collide elementary particles together, like protons, you produce other elementary particles, like Higgs bosons, like the Higgs boson or other ones. But you can actually also, instead of colliding protons, you can decide to collide large nuclei, which is many, many, many protons together. Um, and this goes under the name of relativistic heavy ion collisions. So an ion is a, you know, you know what an ion is, it's a, a nucleus. And, and so if you have large heavy ions, which means there are many, many protons inside, uh, and if you speed them up to very high velocity, high, very high speeds, then they're relativistic. If you then collide them, they release a lot of energy. And so by colliding very large nuclei at relativistic velocities, you can actually have access to this, uh, to this phase diagram. The two big experiments currently that are doing this 
This one is the relativistic heavy ion collider at Brookhaven in uh, Long Island. It's a typical particle accelerator. There's rings here that speed up the protons, or in this case, lead actually. This one, a uh, gold, this one is colliding gold nuclei. So gold is accelerated, accelerated, goes around the ring uh, in opposite directions and collide at certain experiments. Here, star is one of the experiments. So that's the experiment in, in Brookhaven. And also the Large Hadron Collider is doing heavy ion collisions. Uh, they collide lead on lead collisions. And again, lead is accelerated through the rings, goes around um, and, and collides uh, head on. And uh, all these experiments, Atlas, Alice, and CMS, are they measuring the outcome of these, of these collisions. So what, is it so, okay, so what is happening, these nuclei are accelerated, they are colliding. The so it's not one proton versus one proton, but it's say 200 protons versus 200 protons. So you get an extremely energetic medium when they collide. And because you have many particles together, this you know from uh, whatever, kindergarten physics, many particles together, they will actually form a medium and come to equilibrium, form a thermal system, like a statistical system, um, in the same way as when you, uh, uh, um, you start boiling water, for instance, at some point. You know, well, it's not exactly the same. But basically, you have a lot of energy together. The system comes to equilibrium, ah, a bit like the, the flow across the car in the, in the morning. Um, so this is a non-equilibrium process. The system comes into thermal equilibrium. And, uh, and the idea is that the temperature is so high here that actually you cross this, uh, you go into the high temperature phase. And so that is what is shown in the phase diagram with these arrows here, RIC and LHC. You start with nuclei, you collide them, and they come to thermal equilibrium at a very high temperature, um, and then they cool down again back to the hadronic phase, and the hadrons are measured in the, in the collider, in the uh, detector. And so this is actually a picture of, a, of, a, of the detector. This is uh, RIC data from STAR. And so the collision happened right in the center here. Actually, the, 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 the gold ions came this way. It collides here, and all these lines are outgoing hadrons that are then detected by the particle detector. And the real challenge here for, for feminologists is to reconstruct what happened in the center of the collision from all these outgoing lines and really determined that the temperature in the center was so high that it reached this high temperature phase, this quark gluon plasma phase. And that's a challenge. And here's a similar plot from the uh, Large Hadron Collider, the Alice experiment. Again, so the, the lead is going along this line here, along the beam pipe. It collides, and all of this is the, the kind of the debris from the uh, collision. Um, and by detecting all these particles, you can reconstruct that in the center of the collision, indeed, an extremely high temperature phase was reached. So that's the consensus that these heavy ion collisions have indeed created a thermal medium, and that the temperature of this medium is larger than the transition temperature. So if the transition is temperature is around here, this is the hadronic phase, this is the quark gluon plasma, the, the uh, experiments have gone to about uh, three times as high temperature, about three times above the transition temperature here. So the, the consensus is that the quark gluon plasma has been created in the lab, basically. And so what, what should we do now? Well, we as a theorist, as a particle theorist, uh, we have to basically now contribute to these um, experiments and compute things that would be of interest for the experiment and test you know, how QCD performs. Uh, in the, uh, compared to the measurements of the, of the data. Um, this is a very clean cut process, so to speak, because QCD is a very well defined theory, as I said in the beginning. The rules in QCD are written down, they're mathematically sound, everything is under control, there's no wiggle room, it's not like, like some effective model where you can say, let's do this or let's do this. It's a well defined theory, it should apply equally well under extreme conditions. So the fact that we're working at very high temperature doesn't change anything. It changes the nature of the matter from hadrons to quarks, but the rules are the same. So we know our, our baseline uh, equations, basically. So all we have to do is compute some fundamental properties of the theory and then predict or postdict these experimental results. That's the, the motivation. So what do we have to do? Well, we like to say we want to solve QCD. Um, that means uh, different things to different people. Uh, but in this case, solving means 
that essentially we have to consider all possible configurations of quarks and gluons and extract properties by, by summing over those conf configurations. I'm saying configurations here and summing in a very loose sense because it's also a quantum theory, so we have to do it in such a way that it is following the rules of quantum mechanics, which it means it's, it's slightly different from um, just putting, you know, making different configurations of, uh, of, you know, little billiard balls or something like that. Um, so it's a quantum mechanical average over all possible configurations. Um, again, this is well defined in principle, um, but it is, of course, a very hard problem. And so for that, we then use a, a numerical approach, which brings us to the topic of, of today, uh, namely this summing over all configurations is done by, by using HPC resources in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a prescription that is called lattice QCD, so lattice quantum chromodynamics. Um, it's very straightforward. You know, you have a theory with degrees of freedom. How are you going to solve it numerically? Well, you discretize it, so you put it on a, on a lattice, uh, typically a cubic, hypercubic lattice. We have space and time, so the lattice doesn't live in three dimensions, but lives in four dimensions. Um, and on this lattice, then, there are quarks and gluons. And the formulations happen to be such that quarks are at the sides of the lattice, the gluons are at the links. This has to do with these fundamental symmetries that completely fix the theory. Um, but it's a very well-defined uh, way to, to, to discretize the theory and preserve the most important uh, properties in terms of, of symmetries. Um, on every link and every side are still many degrees of freedom because quarks and gluons come in different, what's called colors, and quarks come in different flavors. So there are, it's not actually, the, the gluons are three by three mat complex three by three matrices, um, and these are uh, vectors. So there's a lot of degrees of freedom living on each, each link and each uh, side. Um, so it's a, big, it's a big system, actually. Um, but by doing this, by discretizing it, it's actually amenable to numerical simulations. And so solving the theory now basically means performing a very high dimensional integral on this discretized space time. And that can be done with important sampling. And so all the standard Monte Carlo techniques can be used to, uh, to, to now perform this calculation. Um, it's, a very, it's a big calculation, as I already said. So uh, high performance computing resources are really essential in order to, to achieve this. So this is a plot I downloaded from the uh, internet. It kind of gives an overview of how this field has progressed. So it's something that's been in the, in the scientific, well, you know, it's been investigated for a long time. So if you remember asymptotic freedom, this fact that quarks become almost free when they're very close together was discovered in 1973. And that property actually then immediately led to the acceptance of QCD as the theory of the strong interactions. And so shortly afterwards, in 1974, uh, the theory was formulated on a lattice, on a space-time lattice, as I've, I've given here, with the idea that it gives a handle on the theory, which is different from considering it one process at a time. Um, so this, the, the field is very old. It, well, it's still younger than I am. But um, it started basically in 1974. And so along these how many years, uh, 40 so many years, it has evolved by simulating the strong interactions on, on very, very small lattices, say with four, four sites in the spatial directions and, and, and eight sites in the temporal direction, to now very big lattices, which are, are much bigger. And the computers that go with this also have increased, uh, of course, tremendously. So the progress has only been uh, possible thanks to the increase in computing power. So I said I downloaded this from the internet and somehow from gigaflops it goes to terafops. So the L is missing in, the, in that one. But, uh, so the current machines are using uh, petaflops uh, uh, com uh, machines basically to, in order to do these type of calculations. And when I said in the beginning I showed the spectrum of QCD, uh, and that paper was from 2008 or 2010. That was the first time the spectrum could be computed with uh, all the parameters right, so to speak. So the, the quark, quarks having the right mass uh, compared to the mass in nature and so on. So it, it, that took about uh, 40 years to get to that point, really. So it's a, a long-standing problem which has driven a lot of uh, development also in, in, in computer ma in machines, basically, to get to this, this point. 
So now to come a little bit closer to what we do here. So we are member of the founding member of what we call the FASOM uh, collaboration. It's uh, uh, people in various places: um, Italy, Ireland, Korea, Denmark. Uh, students, postdocs, people written in smaller letters are people who have. Many of them are students, actually, who worked on this project and then moved on to other uh, places. Um, so it's an evolving uh, uh, collaboration. Um, and we have been lucky to have a lot of access, access to a lot of HPC resources on, on the Iraq, which is funded by the Research Council for Particle Physics, SDFC, uh, PRAISE as well, and then, of course, HPC Wales and S uh, CW. And uh, in the last year or so, we had a lot of support from the SA2C as well. So that's all been very useful. Um, so Jonas is in the room, and Alan is in the room. Sam here as well, no. Um, so what do we do in this collaboration? How do we attack the problem? Well, very, uh, very short introduction. As I already said, it's discretized. It's a four-dimensional system, and we treat it as a, a statistical system. Uh, it's discretized with, with letter spacings, put in a finite box, finite number of sites. The integral, basically you have to do an integral then, which is done by important sampling. And you want it to take the continuum limit eventually, so take the discretization to zero, and also the infinite volume limit to so take the number of sites to infinity. Uh, to, to mimic, to, to basically have everything under control. And then we consider finite temperature, and temperature is identified as the extent in the time direction. This is a technical remark which uh, doesn't make sense really if you don't know about it. Um, but then essentially it's a two-stage procedure because first we have to generate configurations of quarks and gluons at all the different temperatures we are interested in. And these are very large ensembles then with maybe a thousand independent configurations. These are stored. So to generate these configurations is already, that's, that's a computationally intensive uh, uh, part of the computation. Uh, but these are ensembles are then stored, so it will also require memory to store these. And then on these ensembles, we compute certain physical properties that we're interested in. Um, so that's a, like a, a second part of the calculation separate from the first part. Um, and then uh, these properties have to be analyzed using some simple analysis techniques or more advanced ones. And so we have worked uh, quite a bit on Bayesian analysis. And now with artificial intelligence becoming very popular, we also started to look at machine learning to analyze our, uh, our data. Um, so I want to discuss, uh, not discuss, I want to show briefly two results just to get an idea of what kind of results um, we do. One is um, essentially what happens to the proton at very high temperature and the other one is um, is this quark gluon plasma a conductor or an insulator? So a very uh, more like a plasma question, a question you would ask in plasma physics really. So the first one though is about what happens to baryons under extreme conditions or you know more, more pictorially how does the proton fall apart when you go to these very high temperatures? And uh, here's some references. So we expect that, as I said, at very high temperature, all the quarks and gluons are very closely together. There's a lot of energy. There are very short distances. So it is no longer possible to identify the proton. The proton just falls apart into three quarks. Um, so this we, we have studied. And actually, the way this happens is in a very interesting and non-trivial way, uh, which is a bit hard to, to explain. But it's, I'll try to explain it here anyhow. So it's the proton is not just a proton, but actually many subatomic particles come in pairs. So there are two of them. And these two in this pair are related by, by chiral symmetry. So chiral symmetry is yet another symmetry in the strong interactions, um, which has to do you know, left-handed and right-handedness. Um, but this symmetry is, uh, is not present at low temperature, but it's expected that this symmetry becomes manifest when you go into the quark gluon plasma. So at low temperature, there's no chiral symmetry. At the quark gluon plasma transition, there is chiral symmetry. That's very loosely speaking the, the idea. And what happens when chiral symmetry uh, emerges, the proton will combine with, a, uh, with his partner. And so there will be two particles in the spectrum that suddenly have the same mass. 
So instead of having the proton and another particle with different masses, they actually come together. And so this doubling of the particle spectrum is actually an indication, a precursor to the fact that the proton will soon enter the quark gluon plasma and fall apart. And so this is something that we set out to study uh, using the lattice QCD simulations. Um, and one reason is that this is actually interesting for phenomenology. So people who uh, use more model descriptions of hadrons at finite temperature, uh, they will they'll find this actually an interesting question to see what happens with uh, these parity partners. So very briefly, a baryon, uh, baryons consist of three quarks. We consider baryons with up, down, and strange quarks. Um, so the proton, for instance, has up, up, down. The neutron has up, down, down. This is the quark contact. Together, these we'll call the nucleon. Um, and then we have strange quarks as well. So we can organize the baryons by the number of uh, strange quarks. So the nucleon has no strange quarks. It's only up and down quarks. And so does the delta. And then there is strangeness minus 1, which are these particles, lambda and sigma. Strangeness minus 2, the size. Strangeness minus 3, the omega. So this goes back to uh, the 1950s, actually, when the quark model was written down. And the uh, strange quark was proposed by Gelman to make sense out of all the particles that were discovered. And Gelman actually proposed this omega particle here with three strange quarks, uh, which was a prediction based on the symmetries and it was indeed discovered. So this, this, this is how you know, quarks came into, into being accepted as underlying all of this. In any case, for each of these baryons here, so for, each, for the nucleon, the lambda, the delta, et cetera, we can study both the partners that are related by chiral symmetry, so both so-called parity partners, and then they're expected to become degenerate when we go to this high temperature phase. Here are some data. This is actually the only data I show. Um, but what we want to study is these, the masses of these particles at low temperature, compare them to the properties in vacuum, and then go to higher temperature to compare to see what happens when the temperature goes up. So here's a big table with all these particles. I'll show them in a figure soon, so you don't have to look at it in detail. But this, this is the idea. We have this number of strange quarks, so the strangeness is 0, minus 1, minus 2, minus 3. And then, say, for the nucleon, we computed the properties of the plus particle and the minus particle, which are expected to become degenerate at high temperature. And the same for the other particles, delta, sigma, et cetera, et cetera. And then we studied the number of temperatures. And this is in, in units of the critical temperature where the transition to the quark gluon plasma happens. So this is at low temperature, and this is very close to the transition to the quark gluon plasma. And so, well, it's very hard to, to see. And this is actually, these are the data. These are the, the experimental values at zero temperature. Um, from the particle data group. So it's better to show this in a, uh, in a, in a figure. Um, so this is the same data, but now put in a figure. And so every box here shows the temperature dependence, so it's T over TC, of these two masses. And uh, the open symbols are always the, the ground states. And the filled symbols are the ones that are not degenerate at low temperature, but are expected to become degenerate when you go into the quark gluon plasma. And, the proton falls apart. Um, and this is indeed what we observe. So this, uh, this particle becomes lighter as the temperature goes up, and it becomes nearly degenerate with the proton uh, down here. And this is true for all these uh, particles. So it's a very characteristic behavior here. Um, and this is then also for strangeness 0, minus 1, and minus 2, and minus 3. So this uh, calculation is actually now a prediction that we make. Based on the symmetries, it, it is expected that these two become degenerate. So this one and these one come together. But it was not yet known how they come together. It could be that one goes up and one goes down, and they meet somewhere in the middle. Or it could be that they both go down and meet somewhere at the lower value. So our prediction is that actually the ground state basically stays flat, and the other one is coming down from above, and they meet meet together there. And so that is important for uh, phenomenology. So people who want to describe the, temp the low temperature phase in a heavy ion collision, um, and they want to describe it in terms of all these hadrons, they should take into account this particular temperature dependence of the uh, hadron masses. 
So all of this was below Tc before going into the quark gluon plasma. T over Tc here stops at 1. And I said at high temperature the proton is expected to fall apart. So how can we see that? Well, um, we can see it, for instance, as follows. If we try to do the same kind of fits to extract the masses, we actually find that above Tc, so to the right here, these fits no longer make sense. The error is, you know, if you do exactly the same procedure, the error is very large. And so you wouldn't say that, oh, this is a, there's very clearly a particle here at these temperatures. So in other words, there are no clearly defined ground states above Tc. So that's the, um, the, the sign that the proton has, has fallen apart at high temperature. And let me skip this. So the conclusion from this part is that at high temperature, indeed, the proton and other baryons fall apart. So that supports this idea that the quarks are liberated and form a quark gluon plasma. And we've investigated this in a slightly indirect way, namely by looking at the degeneracy in the spectrum, which emerges at higher temperature. And then this has applications to heavy ion phenomenology. In the last uh, five minutes or so, I'll discuss a second topic, which is a little bit closer to, uh, to, to ordinary plasma physics. Um, so maybe you're familiar with this from more like engineering problems. And this is the problem of uh, transport, so diffusion and, and conductivity. Um, and this is based on, on this work here. So now let's think about the quark gluon plasma. Let's not think about any more about the strong interactions and it all being really difficult, but just think of it as we have a box uh, or a container with quark gluon plasma, and it's like an ordinary plasma, so it has certain properties. It can be very sticky or it can be very fluid. So in other words, it can, be, uh, it can have a high or a low viscosity. Um, also, quarks have an electrical charge. And so if I put an electric field on the system, there will be some response. And so the question is, is the quark gluon plasma, is it a, a conductor or is it an insulator? So what are its properties for um, under electrical disturbances? And so what we uh, set out to uh, compute using lattice QCD is actually the conductivity of the quark gluon plasma. And what can you expect? Well, again, think about an ordinary plasma. If you have a, if you put on an electric field, a, a, a charge carrier goes through the plasma. If the plasma is very weakly coupled, it will only every now and then scatter with a plasma constituent. And so it will have a very long mean free path and the conductivity will be large then. And if it only scatters every now and then, it means that the coupling is fairly weak. And so a, a weakly coupled system has a large mean free path and a large conductivity. But we also said that actually QCD is very strongly coupled. You can't really look at quarks uh, individually um, too well. And so maybe there's a, even in the high temperature, there's still a remnant of strong coupling, namely that a quark will scatter with other quarks you know, much more frequently than in, a, in, a, in an electromagnetic plasma. And so the mean free path will actually be very small. And then uh, the conductivity will also be small compared to the, to the other case. And so the question we set out here is that if we look at the quark gluon plasma as a medium with electrical charges, is it a, a system which is essentially weakly coupled with a very large conductivity, or is it essentially strongly coupled with a very small uh, conductivity? So this can be computed from first principles. You don't have to look at these equations. It, just to know that it involves the electromagnetic current. Um, from the perspective of data analysis, what is interesting is that it's much more complicated than the spectrum calculation I showed just before, where we computed the masses of the baryons. And the reason it's much more, co uh, much more complicated is that um, we, just, we don't need just the spectrum. We actually need to understand the dynamics in time. So it's a dynamical question rather than uh, the, the static spectrum, so to speak. And that means that on, on this lattice QCD approach, we need to do a difficult inversion problem, which we in the past have done with Bayesian analysis and we're now looking at with the machine learning techniques. So here, anyhow, here are the results. This is the conductivity as a function of temperature normalized in a way. So this particular coefficient here is just a sum of the electrical charges of the quarks. And in our unit system, conductivity has the same unit as temperature. So we divide by temperature to have a dimensionless combination here. 
And what we see then here is that the conductivity, so this is the temperature in MeV, so 200 is about 10 to the 12 Kelvin. Uh, and in units of Tc, the phase transition happens here. And what we see here is that in the low temperature phase, the conductivity is quite small, and then it rises above uh, Tc. So in the quark-gluon plasma phase, it goes up. And that makes sense with which what I said uh, earlier. At high temperature, quarks are closer, quarks uh, become quasi-free. If they become free, the mean free path becomes longer and the conductivity should be larger. So at higher temperature, indeed, the conductivity goes up, which is consistent with the fact that the system is becoming more weakly coupled. This is a comparison with other calculations. Actually, we did the first calculation of this already in 2007, um, with just one data point here. And since then, we've been improving this quite a lot. So now we have more realistic simulations with up, down, and strange quarks, and also a much larger temperature range here. So this is this has been, it's been a long-standing uh, problem, which really relied on the fact that computing resources are getting you know, way better and algorithms improve a lot. Um, I can also look at how the electrical charges fluctuate. So this is a normal susceptibility fluctuating charges. <coughs> and I'm showing you this here because then I can combine the diffusion, the, sorry, I combine the conductivity and the susceptibility, divide them and get a diffusion coefficient. So this comes from an, an Einstein relation. This is essentially you know, physics that Einstein wrote down. How does a particle diffuse through a, through a medium? And so we can compute the diffusion coefficient. And the interesting feature here is that it has actually a minimum at the uh, critical temperature, where the transition from the hadronic phase to the quark gluon plasma phase happens. So this result indicates that also in the in a transport coefficient, like the diffusion constant, you're able to see the transition. And moreover, the absolute value, the numerical value, to 1 over 2 pi t, is uh, in some sense is very small which means that the system is strongly coupled. So this was the, the first comprehensive study of the conductivity. And um, so a few things to note. It is consistent with a strongly coupled plasma, which fits, fits in with the picture that has been developed for this system. It increases at larger temperatures, where the system becomes weakly coupled. And our findings are actually used in phenomenological studies because they are relevant for heavy ion collisions, for instance, when there are very strong magnetic fields. If you want to do uh, uh, transport theory or magnetohydrodynamics or so on, at some point you have to know the conductivity, and that's where our uh, numerical values then uh, are being used. So that's quite re rewarding. OK, so summary. So as I said, strong interaction is one of the four fundamental forces. It's really interesting because you go from very strong coupling at large distances, or confinement, to weak coupling at small distances, so asymptotic freedom, and trying to understand how these come to go together uh, teaches you a lot about the strong force. It's not just a theoretical question. It's investigated experimentally at particle accelerators. So that provides a very important motivation for this work. It requires large-scale computing and, and lots of clever methods. And so it's, it's quite exciting. And we definitely need you know, more and more HVC resources all the time. So, that's why you are here. OK, thanks. Thank you very much, Charles. We have time for maybe one quick question. Um, I, I know nothing about this, but um, in terms of the drivers for the simulations going forward, do you tend, are you tending to try them at the bigger simulations? Or are you more interested in trying to get better accuracy? Yeah, yeah. So there are two directions to go to. One is that our, uh, let me see, I skipped this plot. So we have to set a few things. We have to set the letter spacing, and we have to basically set the quark masses. And the quark masses are, so there are three quarks, up, down, and strange. The strange quark is fine, but the up and down are still a little bit too heavy. And this has to do with the lighter the quarks are, the more difficult it becomes to invert a certain matrix. Basically, this relies on inverting matrices. And the, the lighter the quarks, the smaller the eigenvalues, and the harder it is to invert. And so, um, so Jonas spent uh, basically a lot of time 
to go from one code that we use to another code where this has all been optimized and, and, and much improved. Um, so one direction we, have, we are going in now, actually as we speak, is to go to lighter quarks and eventually we want to end up with quarks which have a mass which corresponds to the one in nature, so physical quark masses. That, that's one direction to go to. The other direction then is that we still have, it's still discretized, so we still have lattice in time and space, and so we also have to take the continuum limit, meaning the lattice spacing goes to zero, and that goes hand in hand with having larger and larger systems, because you want to keep the same physical size with smaller and smaller lattice lying underneath. So that's the other direction to go into. Um, and they, they both, both have to happen, essentially. Yeah. 